Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Da, for the introduction. So, my name is Mehreen Sohail, and today the topic of my presentation is to cover the pediatric parts for the BCPS exam. Is my voice clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this is the disclosure. So learning objective. Today, uh, at the completion of this uh, session, uh, we will be able to introduce the pediatric patients and classify the pediatric patients. And then we will discuss the most common pediatric diseases that are observed worldwide and discuss immunization schedule and get familiar with the pediatric patient cases that are usually being asked in the previous exam. So introduction to pediatrics. Pediatric Patients are basically specialized patient population and whenever a pharmacist is uh, uh, recommending any therapeutic drug or processing any pediatric order, uh, he or she should keep in mind that pediatric patients are not just a little adults. They are much more different from the adult population uh, in regards to their pharmacokinetics as well as pharmacodynamics uh, uh, properties. So basically, pediatric patients are divided into uh, according to their age and weight. And with respect to the ages, uh, the new needs are the patients from birth to younger than 28 days means uh, the, when the patient is born to the 28 days of life, uh, the baby is uh, neonate. And then uh, infants are those uh, babies uh, with one month to 12 months of life, means uh, less than one year. And then children are defined as the, uh, of, as the pediatric population from one to 12 years of age. And then under 18 years, it comes uh, under the adolescence. So this is how uh, the pediatric population is divided according to their age. Now, new needs are further divided into two categories, full-term new needs and pre-term new needs. Full-term new needs are born after the full gestational age, that is after 37 weeks of life. And preterm neonates are the neonates which are, uh, are the babies which are born before 37 week of gestation. They are also known as premature neonates. And those uh, neonates which are born before 37 weeks of gestation usually have low body weight. The weight which is less than 2.5 kg is considered as low body weight. Uh, very, uh, the uh, uh, neonates are also divided according to their ages. Preterm baby with very low body weight and extremely low body weight. Very low body weight refers to as the uh, weight less than 1.5 kg. And if the patient have weight less than 1 kg, it refers to an extremely low body weight. So why uh, the gestational age? and the weight of the patient is important for a pharmacist. So whenever a pharmacist is processing the pediatric orders, he should keep in mind uh, that uh, the gestational age and also the weight of the patient because there are many doses that are uh, calculated and that varies in uh, you know, dose and frequency according to their weight. For instance, if a, a neonate is term baby, like 37 or 38 week, 
and it, uh, and her weight is greater than uh, two kg. The dose of gentamicin would be four mg per kg q uh, thirty six hourly or QD. Uh, but if a manunate is preterm and, and his weight is less than two kg, then the dose frequency increases to thirty uh, forty eight hourly QD means the 4 mg per kg q48 hourly uh, it is basically due to uh, the reason that the that the kidney uh, function is not well developed in preterm babies and and that's why the dose uh, ranges and varies according to their uh, you know days of life so what is corrected gestational age Basically, corrected gestational age is the actual age of the uh, baby plus its gestational age. Means, say, if a baby is born 32 weeks and it's been about one week since he has born, so one week plus 37, uh, 32 weeks is equal to 33 weeks. So this is called corrected gestational age. There are many doses which are calculated with the corrected gestational age and there are many drugs that are uh, administered irrespective of the of the um, uh, baby born prematurely or uh, irrespective of the corrected gestational age for example if we talk about vaccines many vaccines are administered irrespective of the weight and age of the patient especially in units and if, uh, except hepatitis B, in which uh, the CDC recommend that if a patient has weight less than 2 kg and is preterm, we should administer hepatitis B vaccine after one month. So uh, the pharmacist should keep in mind uh, the, uh, the weight and age of the patient uh, while prescribing while uh, suggesting a drug or also while processing the pediatric orders. So the creatinine clearance formula for uh, pediatric population is calculated by Schwartz formula. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it is used uh, for preterm term uh, till 18 year of age. So creatinine clearance formula is K which is a constant multiplied by length of the baby divided by serum creatinine. And the K, the constant or pro proportionality constant varies. If the patient has a very low body weight, then the value is 0 0.33. And if, if it is term and less than one year, then the value is 0 0.45. So a pharmacist should also know uh, the, uh, uh, that the baby is either preterm or, uh, or his or her is weight, uh, weight is under the category of low body weight. Then uh, he will be able to uh, you know, calculate the clearance formula uh, correctly. Now um, let's move on to the uh, first main topic of our presentation, that is sepsis. So sepsis is one of the major uh, leading cause of death uh, in worldwide. So whenever uh, the patient is uh, admitted into an ICU, neonatal ICU or pediatric ICU, the one of the major cause of that and mortality is sepsis. The most of the patient admitted in the uh, ICU setting uh, presents with the sepsis or septic shock. Infants less than one year are at higher risk of uh, uh, developing sepsis, especially preterm and neonates. And it is uh, because in neonates or in preterm babies, the immunity system of the patient is very weak. So they are more prone to infection. Majorly causes, uh, sepsis majorly causes respiratory tract infection or bacteremia. Bacteria is basically the infection of the blood. Most common causative agents. If uh, if the child is less than two years, then GBS, gram uh, streptococcus gram B infection, E. coli, Listeria monocytogen, and HSV are most common causative agents. And if a child is greater than two years, then streptococcus pneumonia, asorius. And Nasseria meningitis and hemophilus B influenza type are common in these patients. 
So uh, uh, we have to remember uh, the most common causative agents according to their age so that we can start the empiric therapy in these patients. Like if a patient, uh, if, if we will know that a that that a new need uh, comes with a uh, finding of sepsis in the ER, then we have to start ampicillin because ampicillin cover have the cover of GBS and Listeria monocytogen. And along with uh, it will cover gram positive and, and then we also have to give gram negative coverage and we can add uh, you know, cefotexime or gentamicin along with it. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is basically a systemic inflammatory response syndrome in the presence of, or as a result of suspected or proven infection. So basically, this is a definition uh, which is given uh, by the, uh, you know, uh, different uh, organizations and it is the main definition of sepsis in adults and peds as well. So what is SIRS? SIRS is systemic inflammatory response syndrome and it, it the presence of at least two of the following four categories out of which one should be abnormal temperature and leukocyte count. So if a, if a pediatric patient is presented in, uh, in ICU setting with hyperthermia or hypothermia, if the temperature is greater than 38.5 or less than 36 uh, degrees centigrade, and if the patient is trachycardic, in new nates, uh, um, bradycardia is also observed. And uh, a, a patient has a mean, a mean respiratory rate greater than two times of that of normal. And leukocyte counts are depressed or elevated. So in these cases, we consider it SIRS. Along with an infection, infection, it can be any pathogen that is uh, attacking the body and it is proven by you know, positive culture, PCR or chest x-ray or any clinical examination. So, uh, so basically what is sepsis? Sepsis should consist of either abnormal temperature plus leuco or leukocyte count along with mean respiratory rate uh, greater than twofold and along with uh, any proven or suspected infection. Now, what is severe sepsis? Severe sepsis is a sepsis which involves multi-organ dysfunction, like your uh, uh, important organs of the body, like cardiovascular organ dysfunction, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or other organ dysfunction is involved, then we will regard it as a severe sepsis. And septic shock. Septic shock is basically sepsis and cardiovascular organ function. This function and it usually require the use of vasopressors uh, to, uh, to uh, treat the sepsis or to uh, uh, you know, um, maintain the MAP, mean arterial pressure. So what are the different types of shock? There are ma four main different types of shock. Number one is hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock mainly occur in the patients uh, with blood loss or severe dehydration. If there is a, a surgery or, or in any other case where there is a severe blood loss or, or any dehydration as a result of diarrhea or vomiting, it can lead to hypovolemic shock. And mostly hypovolemic shock respond to fluid resuscitation therapy. Now, second comes obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is, is a kind of shock that is caused by the obstruction of blood flow to and from the heart. It usually include uh, pulmonary emboli. If a uh, uh, embolus blocks the arteries or veins, uh, veins, uh, the blood flow from and to the heart is restricted and it causes obstructive shock. Now comes cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is basically caused by a primary pump failure. Like uh, if we talk about myocardium, which is very commonly observed in pediatric patients, or endocarditis, endocarditis. So it may, might lead to cardiogenic shock. And fourth one is distributive shock. Distributive shock is caused by mild distribution of the circulating volume. 
in uh, in in distributive shock what happens that the uh, blood do not reaches to the main part of the body like brain lungs heart and it is because it might be because of the capillary leakage of the blood from the peripheries that uh, results uh, in the vasodilation and uh, and vasodilation causes uh, the prevention of the flow of the blood to the main parts of the body so mostly children uh, presenting with the uh, with the cases of shock uh, present with the cold shock Cold shock is a kind of uh, septic shock in which the cardiac output is low and uh, systemic vascular resistance is high. So why this happens? Um, uh, in pediatric population, the uh, the the children are unable to pump the blood uh, correctly or or with force as compared to the adults. So uh, in pediatric population, usually the patients with the shock have low cardiac output. And as a result, the body activate compensatory mechanism, which increases the systemic vascular resistance. So in, in pediatric population, uh, mostly uh, patients present with low cardiac output and high systemic vas vascular resistance. And this is also known as cold shock. And uh, it, in, it, is, it is in contrast with the adults. In adults, as the uh, patient is able to pump the blood and force the heart, so mostly the patients have low, high cardiac output and low vascular risk. So um, in such cases, uh, uh, with a patient with a cold shock, the the choice of the vasopressor is different. Like in pediatric population, we usually prefer epinephrine and dopamine because it acts on the heart and modulate and improve the cardiac output. Whereas in adults, we use norepinephrine because norepinephrine acts on the peripheries and reduces the systemic vascular resistance. So uh, I hope you all are getting it. Okay, so now pathophysiology of sepsis. So what happens when a pathogen invades in the body, inflammatory and pro-inflammatory cytokines activate, which uh, invades the epithelial cells and epithelial activation occurs. And as a result of uh, uh, activation of the epithelial cells, uh, other immune system of the body get activated and, uh, and it causes release of the vasoactive substances, complement activation of CD4 protein and other uh, coagulation cascade. And as a result of all this mechanism, uh, endothelial uh, cell damage occurs. And if the pathogen is able to cause the endothelial cell damage, it invades into the blood. And when the pathogen invades into the blood or flow into the blood, it causes sepsis or bacteremia. And the, um, sepsis or bacteremia leads to SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And as a result of this, uh, capillary leakage, microvascular occlusion, organ dysfunction, hypertension, hypoxia, acidosis place. So it is a, a brief picture of the pathophysiology of sepsis and um, it all leads to, you know, endothelial activation and damage. And it all causes the, uh, as a result, it all causes fever. It causes hypertension, it reduces or it might increase leukocyte count, it increases the respiratory rate of the patient. So what is the management of sepsis? There are three main points to be considered uh, while treating the pa a patient with sepsis. First of all, early recognition of sepsis. Sepsis must be, uh, you know, diagnosed or identified by the uh, by the doctors uh, 
uh, on the early basis because uh, uh, when a patient is admitted in the ER setting and he's presented with the sepsis and, and we start the therapy within the one hour of the hospital administration, the mortality rate is only 20 to uh, 10%. But if, if the treatment is delayed and the patient uh, treatment is started after six hours of the admi admission to the hospital, it, it mortality rate rises to 50 to 60%. So that's why early recognition of sepsis is very important to reduce the mortality rate and the proper treatment of the patient. Early source control and antibiotic administration. What is the source? of uh, uh, pathogen is there any catheter inserted is it is ventilation associated uh, uh, you know infection or any other is it is uh, infection that is being transmitted by mother to the baby so uh, recognition of the source and its control and start of the antibiotic administration is very important, an early reversal of the shock state. And this shock state reversal can be achieved by supportive treatment. Like if the patient is depressed, uh, if, if a patient needs airways management, if a patient needs ventilation. So all the... Uh, uh, all the things should be considered while managing a patient with sepsis. So first of all, if a patient uh, is uh, admitted with sepsis, septic shock, fluid resuscitation is the first step. We usually give crystalloids, normal saline, or 0.9% or lingeractate. Uh, 20 to 60 ml per kg boluses are given over 5 to 10 minutes. Broad spectrum antibiotics are started, but before that, cultures are being sent. And if a, a patient is zero to one month, ampicillin and gentamicin are the drug of choice. So, um, why ampicillin and gentamicin are drug of choice for neonates uh, uh, with sepsis? It's because, as we have discussed, that ampicillin uh, is a drug of choice for listeria monocytogen and GBS. So these both are the possible uh, causative agent of sepsis if in neonates. So that's why we give ampicillin along with gentamicin, which will cover gram-negative uh, bacteria like H influenza. If a patient is one to three months, ampicillin plus ceftriaxone or vancomycin plus ceftriaxone is given. But we do not give ceftriaxone in new names. Um, it's uh, mainly because ceftriaxone increases the levels of bilirubin in new names, and it causes the uh, condition known as carnic terrace. Carnic terrace is basically a condition in which the bilirubin levels increases in the brain. And it is, it is a fatal condition and it might lead to death. So that's why we avoid ceftriaxone in the early days of life. If the patient is more than three months, then ceftriaxone and vancomycin is usually given. And ceftriaxone uh, cover gram-negative bacteria and vancomycin usually covers uh, gram-positive and MRSA. Hemodynamic support, dopamine is drug of choice and epinephrine for cold shock. And dubitamine, norepinephrine, milrinone are also being added if needed. Supportive treatment, role of corticosteroids. So uh, what is the role of corticosteroids uh, in the patient with uh, shock or sepsis? So basically, uh, the patient with septic shock or uh, sepsis, uh, DEXA is given and uh, it, DEXA or hydrocort is given and it, it, it is shown to reduce the inflammation. Uh, at the uh, at the inflammatory site that reduces the damage of the cells. So uh, it, it have not very promising uh, results, but uh, many experts recommend adding corticosteroids before one hour or with along with the antibiotic therapy. Okay, that's it. And. Now it comes to meningitis. So meningitis, it is an inflammation of the pia and arachnoid meninges that surround the brain and spine. 
spinal cord. So, as we know that there are uh, a layer of three meninges in the uh, in the brain. That is dura matter, arachnoid, and pia matter. So, in meningitis, two layers, pia matter and arachnoid uh, meninges, are being affected. Meningitis is basically divided into bacterial meningitis, fungal meningitis, viral meningitis, TB meningitis. And uh, 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 so when we talk about acute bacterial meningitis, it is the most common and serious life threat, life global threat with high mortality and morbidity among the patients. So it is the most common and most serious type of meningitis, which is usually being observed in pediatric populations. So what are the clinical signs of the patient who are presented with meningitis? Patients with meningitis would have stiff neck, neutral rigidity. Neutral rigidity means a stiffness of neck, back pain, carnic sign. Carnic sign is a lifting of the legs to the 90 degrees and uh, the legs are full and the knee, they are unable to uh, you know uh, straight up their legs so this sign is called carnic sign brusky sign brusky sign is basically when uh, when a patient's head is lift up it lifts along with their knees and legs in volume Involuntary movement, basically involuntary movement of knees and leg occur whenever uh, the uh, uh, neck of the patient is moved upward and headache, photophobia, altered mental status and seizures all are seen uh, with the patient uh, meningitis. Causes most common bacterial species are streptococcus pneumonia, H influenza and Neisseria meningitis. How is bacterial, how is the meningitis diagnosed? Or if you want to make a differential diagnosis that whether a meningitis is bacterial, viral, or fungal, or TB. So we have to uh, do the lumbar puncture, LP, and then CSF culture is the gold standard method for uh, the identifying the uh, uh, meningitis and the cause of meningitis. So uh, uh, this is a chart uh, which is showing uh, the causative agents with that causes bacterial meningitis according to their ages. So in the patient, uh, less than one month step to focus uh, agitatia. Strep B, uh, group B streptococci is most common, as with sepsis and mandated is same. E. coli, clepsila, proteal, listeria, monocytogens. These are uh, more or less same as that of sepsis. If we come one to three months, then strep B, is group B streptococci, E. coli, clepsila, proteus, L, monocytogens, streptococcus pneumonia, Neisseria mandatus, hemophilus influenza is also seen. So uh, as we come with greater than five years, streptococcus pneumonia and Neisseria mandatus are most common causative agent. So why our pharmacists should know uh, the uh, causative agents according to their ages so that he can um, relate it to the therapy of antibiotics that is given. He can, uh, you know, uh, suggest the proper antibiotic to the physicians and uh, be cautious or, and also be cautious while processing the pediatric orders in the pharmacy. CSF findings for differential meningitis. So uh, the thing which uh, need to be kept in mind while uh, uh, looking up the CSF finding, uh, in bacterial meningitis, the leukocytes counts are very high. Normally, the leukocytes count uh, in CSF is less than three. But in bacterial meningitis, or you can see the la second last, in partially treated bacterial meningitis, the leukocyte counts are up to 5,000. And in uh, TB meningitis, the level of protein progressively increases and it is high as compared to other, uh, other uh, meningitis. And uh, in uh, 
bacterial meningitis the level of glucose is also very low in the csf fluid so this is a chart uh, which differentiate between different uh, types of uh, uh, meningitis and specific tests that are done like in bacterial for bacterial uh, infection gram stain obviously and rapid antigen screen test is being conducted cultures are being sent for tb acid fall organism on smear uh, is uh, or pcr test is being conducted so if we come uh, on the treatment of acute bacterial meningitis uh, first of all we have to start antibiotic therapy along with that neuroprotective strategies and management of raised icp is also a concern with patient with meningitis um when mostly the patient uh, who are diagnosed or suspect meningitis they have low levels of sodium in the blood they have hyponatremia which causes hyponatremia causes the flow of the fluid from extracellular spaces to the intracellular cells of the brain and when the fluid accumulates into the cells of the brain it causes uh, edema cerebral edema and cerebral edema uh, ra raises the intraocular pressure icp is raised and that's why we have to um, start neuro protocol strategy uh, in which we we usually give levy levetiracetam along with pyridoxine and mannitol or 3% hypertonic line is being added to decrease the icp basically whenever the uh, uh, hypertonic line is given uh, it reduces the uh, cerebral edema because it uh, when, uh, when the sodium level increases in the blood it causes the flow of fluid from intracellular sp uh, cells to the extracellular spaces that reduces the uh, cerebral edema and as a result icp is decreased now uh, second uh antibiotic therapy the choice of antibiotic therapy uh, should be um, brought first when uh, when the proper differential diagnosis is not made so uh, usually when a patient come in er uh, we also uh, give uh, antibacterial along with acyclovir to cover the viral meningitis and until the proper or differential diagnosis is made after that anti inflammatory agents also have a role uh, in meningitis because it decreases the cerebral um, inflammation that also uh, have a role in decreasing the icp so dexamethasone on uh, uh, at the dose of 0.6 mg per kg per day divided to 6 for 4 days uh, is given uh, and is recommended for the patients with meningitis so here, here is the empiric choice of antimicrobials according to their age so if the patient less than 1 month And, and we know that it uh, that the cause of meningitis might be GBS or Listeria monocytogenes. So uh, uh, to cover its uh, coverage, we add pen ampicillin, and along with ampicillin, we give gentamicin for the gram negative coverage. If the patient is one and in less than one month, we usually avoid giving ceftriaxone uh, due to the reason of chronic tears. And in one to three months, uh, ceftriaxone along with ampicillin or cefotaxim. Cefotaxim is uh, usually less recommended, and ceftriaxone is recommended more because ceftriaxone can cross the blood-brain barrier more uh, quickly and have a high concentration uh, in brain as compared to the cefotaxim. And greater than three months, ceftriaxone or cefotaxim both are recommended. in in post op patients or who have who are uh, uh, who have any post surgery or any neurosurgery csf shunt uh, is being placed 
it is a type of uh, you know external device that is uh, being placed in the brain uh, for the uh, for the drainage purpose so uh, if if such uh, if any such um, uh, uh, concern is uh, or specific uh, patient is if uh, is admitted or is uh, require antimicrobial treatment for the meningitis, then vancomycin is added to them because vancomycin is a drug of choice for MRSA. And if, if for post-op and CSFSHN patients, uh, MRSA uh, is the most common causative agent. So that's why in, uh, in those patients, vancomycin is also added for the gram-positive coverage. Now, chemoprophylaxis of meningitis. So, uh, it is recommended that uh, the uh, that the patient, uh, the staff, or even the uh, children that are uh, that have a close contact with the patients should receive a prophylaxis dose of rifampicin. To, uh, to cover the uh, prophylaxis of Neisseria meningitis and H influenza. And as alternative, if, uh, if the surrounding population is resistant to rifampin, then ciprofloxacin can be used as an alternative. Rif Let's discuss a patient case. So an infant born at 36 week gestation Developed respiratory distress, hypotension, modeling at five hours of life. A child is transported to a neonatal intensive care unit where he was he has witnessed seizures and cultures are obtained. Maternal vaginal culture are positive for gram B streptococcin and three doses of ampicillin were given to the mother after before delivery. What is the best empiric antimicrobial regimen in this patient? So Anyone can answer? Mm. Any guesses? Let me see the chat box. Dr. Marine. Recording and progress. Yes. yes. Uh, can um, please Rida, can you read the answers for me from the chat if anyone has given the answer? Okay, uh, Dr. Marine, uh, chat box is not visible to you. Mm, I think uh, I should open it here. Uh, I can read, but uh, I'm just asking. Okay, now it's visible. Okay. Should I read it for you? No, no, it's okay. I can. Okay. Okay, so many of you have answered B and C. Okay, so um, let me discuss this uh, patient case. So uh, first option is vancomycin plus cefotexim. Do this patient need vancomycin right now? But when vancomycin is recommended? Vancomycin is recommended when there is a chances of hospital-acquired pneumonia or 
any community acquired pneumonia but the patient's infant and it is it is uh, uh, it is at if uh, 5 hours of life and it is uh, not admitted to the hospital for 2 days uh, if a patient is admitted for a hospital for more than 24 or 48 hours, then we can consider it for hospital acquired pneumonia. So uh, there is no, uh, you know, uh, indication for giving vancomycin. So uh, answer A is incorrect. Let's move to answer B, ampicillin plus ceftazidim. This is the correct answer. Because we know that uh, ampicillin is, is important for the patients uh, to cover group B streptococci. The ampicillin is the only drug uh, which covers the group B streptococci in these, uh, in these options, apart from vancomycin. So uh, ampicillin will cover gram-positive coverage and ceftazidim will give gram-negative coverage. If we talk about uh, option number C, ampicillin plus ceftriaxone, it can be given. Ampicillin plus ceftriaxone can be given, but as we have discussed, the ceftriaxone is not recommended in neonates because it can cause carnic terrors, increase levels of bilirubin in the brain. So that's why answer C is also incorrect. Now, if we talk about the uh, option number D, Ceftazidim plus gentamicin. This uh, uh, ceftazidim plus gentamicin both will give a, uh, give more gram negative coverage, and we have to give the coverage for GBS and Listeria monocytogen that will be covered by ampicillin. So that's why in out of four, the uh, the option number B is correct. Uh, I have one question, Marimba ji. Yes. मुझे इसका रीजन बताइएगा कि हमने जेंटामाइसिन को फर्स्ट चॉइस क्यों नहीं रखा है इसका आपने क्या बताया देखो जेंटामाइसिन के साथ ऑप्शन में है सेफ्टाजिडिम अगर हम सेफ्टाजिडिम के साथ जेंटामाइसिन देंगे तो हमारे पास ग्राम पॉजिटिव कवरेज के लिए या जीबीएस के लिए या लिस्टेरिया मोनोसाइटोजिन कवर करने के लिए कोई ऑर्गेनिज्म नहीं होगा that's why we ampicillin to give ampicillin. With ampicillin, we will give ampicillin for negative coverage for ceftazidim. That's why we didn't consider ceftazidim because it can cause carnic terrors. And we avoid it in new units. Okay, now let's discuss patient case number two. Culture results from a patient above reveal gram-positive rods in CSF. What recommendation regarding the antibiotic prophylaxis is best? The patient's five-month-old stepsister is a high risk because she is not fully immunized. Therefore, the patient should receive rifampin. The patient should receive rifampin to eliminate nasal carriage of the pathogen. Antibody prophylaxis is not indicated in this patient. All close contacts should receive rifampin for prophylaxis. Yes, answer D is correct. All close contact should receive rifampin for prophylaxis. If there is any other option in this confusion, then you can ask me. Yes, Okay, let's discuss this patient case. A six-year-old boy present to the emergency department with a temperature of 400, uh, 104 Fahrenheit, altered mental status, and pedagogy. There is no history of trauma. The result of toxicity scream are negative. CBC counts weeks with 20% ban. Culture the uh, culture results are pending. The, uh, the patient has no known allergies, which antibiotic provide the best impact coverage. 
इसका आंसर बताएं यस आंसर सी इज करेक्ट सेक्ट्राइजोन प्लस वेंकोमाइसिन बिकॉज ही इज अ सिक्स ईयर ओल्ड बॉय एंड ही माइट हैव कम्युनिटी एक्वाइड इन्फेक्शन और ही हैज ऑल्टर्ड मेंटल स्टेटस एंड 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 इज विद फीवर सो द मोस्ट बेस्ट ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर इम्पेरिक ट्रीटमेंट इज सेफ्ट्राइजोन प्लस वेंकोमाइसिन फॉर दिस पेशेंट why we are not giving ampicillin plus genta koi ye bata sakta hai ki humne choice option number 1 kyun nahi choose kiya humne option number a isliye choose nahi kiya kyunki ha पॉजिटिव एजेंट्स ऑफ पेशेंट विद ग्रेटर देन सिक्स ईयर्स आर जो हम डिस्कस किए हैं उनमें क्या था एजेंट्स नमोनिया एंड मैंजाइटिस सो दीज बोट ऑर्गेनिज्म कैन बी कवर्ड बाई सेफ्टाइजो एंड वेंकोमाइस एंड देर इज नो नीड टू गिव एम्पिसलिन एम्पिसलिन इज ओनली रिकमेंडेड अर्ली एजेस ऑफ लाइफ बिकॉज इट कवर जी बी एस एंड लिस्टेरिया मोनोसाइट्रोजन ओके नाउ लेट्स कम टू थर्ड टॉपिक रेस्पायटी सिंशियल वायरस आर एस बी सो इट्स बेसिकली फ्लू or you can say it's a viral infection seasonal occurrence uh, it occurs seasonally depending upon the geographical location and usually last 4 to 5 months so mujhe ye koi bata sakta hai is baat ke jawab ki flu sardiyo mein kyu hota hai why flu or uh, viral infection mostly occur in winter season iska koi koi specific reason koi logic ये थोड़ा सा आउट ऑफ कॉन्टेक्ट बात है वैसे लेकिन ये मुझसे किसी ने सवाल किया था उस वक्त शायद मुझे भी इतना इसका आइडिया नहीं था कि इसका आंसर क्या हो सकता है बट जब इसके ऊपर मैंने सर्च किया और रीड किया तो इट हैज बीन सजेस्टेड और हाइपोथिसाइज दैट आर एस बी इन्फेक्शन और वायरल इन्फेक्शन बिकम मोर स्टेबल एट द कोल्डर टेम्परेचर or you, or when the when there are winters the uh, uh, people remain indoor and they they not go outdoors so that's why uh, close contact with each other is more uh, uh, is more and it can cause or uh, transmit uh, infection from one person to another so uh, this might be the reason uh, why the uh, cold is very common in winters exactly rabia has answered okay bacterial growth in environment okay merinosum mel and rabia because in winter season people remain in close contact with each other yes so what are the signs symptoms new nates it uh, it uh, causes lower respiratory tract infection it attacks to the body more severely because in new nates of preterm babies the Uh, the immunity level is very low so it might cause bronchitis or bronchiolitis or pneumonia sneezing lethargy fever irritability poor feeding and apnea it also causes a shortness of breath in older children upper respiratory tract infection rhinorrhea cough uh, is common and it is self limiting it, uh, it is uh, mild and it treated uh, without any uh, you know a therapy so for rsv prophylaxis what non pharmacological prophylaxis we can take avoid crowds during rsv season and consequently use good hand washing practice uh, 
and for in for prophylaxis pharmacological treatment is uh, pelivizumab which uh, which is recommended for the patients uh, 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 whenever uh, the patient is uh, uh, indicated for uh, the rsv then uh, the prophylaxis treatment should be given to the uh, new nates especially so a 55 red uh, percent reduction hospitalization for rsv is being observed with the use of pelivizumab no reduction overall mortality is observed does not interfere with the process of to, of vaccines and do not recommend it for the prevention of nocosomal transmission of rsv and the and note if a person is diagnosed with rsv then uh, it is not recommended to use it is only used for prophylaxis in the patient who are at high risk the patient who are at high risk high risk means the patients should be either uh, preterm less than 28 week less than 32 week or any week but if the patient has cld if the patient is uh, immunocompromised if the patients have congenital abnormalities or any neuromuscular disease so in such type of cases if the patient has congenital heart disease in such type of uh, scenarios uh, the uh, dose uh, prophylactic dose is recommended and the maximum number of doses are 5 and it is given monthly what is the treatment of RSV? Supportive care, we can give, uh, you know, um, uh, for um, treatment ke liye dete hai, for the flu purpose, uh, anti-allergy or uh, acetaminophen or ribavirin. Ribavirin is also recommended uh, for use uh, for the S uh, RSV treatment. Inhale beta agonist for the patient uh, who are more prone or who are asthmatic. Corticosteroids, um, mainly corticosteroids are not recommended and it is found that it should be avoided uh, for the uh, treatment of RSV. And inhaled hypertonic line. Inhaled hypertonic line is also uh, used and it is recommended because it increases the nasal flow and reduces the uh, squeezing and uh, uh, you know flow uh, flow of the patient and uh, if we talk about the antibiotics antibiotics are not recommended for uh, rsv treatment that's all for rsv otitis media Otitis media is also a very common cause uh, of occurrence of infection in pediatric population. And it is an infection of the middle ear, bulging uh, tympanic membrane, pleurin, fluid, erythema, or otalgia. Otalgia is basically pain in the middle ear. So there is a accumulation of fluid which is uh, pleurent fluid, uh, like pus forming fluid in the middle ear. And if it is severe, uh, it needs treatment. Or if it is only fluid and it is not uh, uh, severe or it is not painful, then uh, the treatment is not recommended. Antibiotic treatment is not recommended. Common pathogens that can cause otitis media viral, streptococcus pneumonia, H influenza, or moxilla is also a, a agent that might cause otitis media. If it is viral, it does not need treatment. But if it is bacterial and it is severe, uh, which, uh, which is painful, uh, otalgia, otalgia is basically what? It is uh, the pain in the middle ear. And if it is painful or it is extreme, then we recommend bacterial, uh, antibacterial treatment. So otitis media, what are the risk factors that cause, it, cause otitis media in children? It's upper airways infection, it's infective rhinitis, it's tobacco smoke exposure, passive uh, smoking, it's Breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is a positive. Uh, it reduces the otitis media. Basically, if you are uh, if you are on uh, a bottle feed, then it might cause otitis media. 
so uh, there are two types of otitis media that are common acute otitis media that requires treatment that is severe that is painful and other type is otitis media with effusion it is basically uh, a condition in which deer is viewed in the middle air but it does not it is not painful and it is not symptomatic so if uh, if it, it is the case uh, we usually do not treat it initially we observe it for one to two months uh, if it is painful then the antibiotic treatment is started and if it is not treatment it get resolves automatically by itself no antibiotic treatment is needed now if you have confirm acute otitis media it if it is severe symptoms if it is painful yes then we will start antibiotic therapy and the first line agent or first drug of choice uh, for treating acute uh, otitis media is amoxicillin and it is it is given uh, at the highest do high doses than the usual it is given on 90 mg per kg per day in divided doses bid uh, amoxicillin augmentin is also recommended amoxicillin plus clavulanate and the alternate if a patient is allergic to penicillin uh, amoxicillin then uh, other uh, agents like ceftriaxone cefepixaben cefcodoxime is also recommended but if it is not uh, if it painful or does not have severe symptoms then uh, and the age is between 6 month to 2 years then uh, delayed antibiotic prescribing do not recommend uh, antibiotic initially uh antibiotic prescribing only if child's child's worsen and does not improve within 48 to 72 hours antibiotic therapy if children if child is less than 6 month if reliable follow up cannot be ensured agar aapko aisa lagta hai ki patient follow up ke liye nahi aayega ya wo follow up nahi kar sakta to aap antibiotic usko de sakte ho otherwise observe the patient and if the patient is between 6 to 2 years then uh, initially don't give antibiotic if it's not painful or if the symptoms are not very severe now reevaluate the patient after 48 or 72 hours if it still uh, uh, is still not resolving after the antibiotic therapy then uh, consider switching the uh, antibiotic start uh, other antibiotic like ceftriaxone clindamycin and or add any other uh, antibiotic into the current regimen so it's all about uh, acute otitis media okay let's this a uh, patient case a 5 month old infant who was born otitis media with amoxicillin for 7 days on follow up examination her pediatrician noticed fullness in the middle ear and cloud in tympanic membrane with decreased mobility she is now a febrile eating well which is the best recommendation for her treatment iska koi jawab batae answer a is correct it's because um patient is now asymptomatic and he does not have pain and his is a febrile so uh, do not give antibiotic at this time and a and is 5 month old infant now it, it is a, a, a high dose of uh, 
But, uh, sorry, it is five year old. So yes, if five years old, then high dose of amoxicillin is recommended. Sorry, answer B is correct. Agar ke six months se two years hoga, to hum uh, antibiotic nahi denge. But kyunki ye five, uh, six months se less or five months se older, to yes, high dose antibiotic would be recommended because in the uh, in the infants the uh, immunity is low and it can cause severe infection. So that's why answer B is correct. Okay, so now let's discuss immunization. There are many different types of uh, vaccines available, including inactivated vaccine, life attenuated vaccine, messenger RNA vaccine, recombinant vaccine, toxoid vaccine, viral vector vaccines, and uh, uh, the schedule of immunization in neonates uh, is seen basically in. Pakistan or in developing countries, uh, the neonates are given three vaccines at birth, BCG, hepatitis B, and oral polio vaccine. But um, if we talk about uh, uh, the CDC recommendation normally, uh, only hepatitis B vaccine is recommended at birth. But if a patient, uh, if, if a um, baby is at developing country or at the high risk uh, population for the polio or BCG, then polio BCG is also given at birth. Now, at, after that, after two months, hepatitis B, DPAP, DPAP, uh, DTAP is basically diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, uh, it, uh, then HIV, polio, pravena, which covers pneumococcal, and RB, rotavirus, uh, rota vaccine. These all vaccines are given in two months of life. Then after four months of life, um, uh, DTAP, HIV, polio, pravena, RB. All are repeated except hepatitis B. So in two months and four months, uh, vaccines are same except hepatitis B. Uh, hepatitis B is given at birth and to after two months. Then at six months, same as two months, influenza is added on with it. And in after one year, one year to 18 months, uh, uh, DTAP, HIV, Pravena, MMR, varicella, influenza, and uh, hepatitis A vaccine is added. Four to six years means uh, there are uh, four doses of uh, DTAP, there are uh, four doses of polio, there are two doses of MMR, MMR first given at the one year of life and then uh, at four years of life. And varicella and influenza are given uh, three times and it can also be given early. Influenza flu vaccine is also repeated early. So this is the uh, pediatric vaccine schedule. Contraindication to immunization. Um, any anaphylactic reaction to vaccine or any of its component, like neomycin, some uh, life vaccines like uh, MMR or uh, uh, oral polio vaccine, uh, these vaccines contain neomycin. So if a patient is an allergic to neomycin, then uh, any alternate vaccine brand should be used. And acute to moderate to severe febrile illness if patient has fever, if patient have immunodeficiency, then uh, 
oral polio vaccine mmr varicella these live vaccines should be avoided in pregnancy mmr and varicella are contraindicated and recent administration of immunoglobulin if there is a recent administration of immunoglobulin then mmr varicella should be avoided because these are live vaccine and may react to the uh, antibody immunoglobulin in the body and can cause anaphylactic reaction misconception about uh, contraindications of vaccine if the patient has ag allergy or mild acute illness or if uh, he or she has recently taken antimicrobial therapy or if there is a reaction to the vaccine only soreness or redness or a slight uh, swelling at the uh, side injection side breast feeding allergies to antibiotics other than neomycin or streptomycin family history of an adverse effect after vaccine administration bahut sare aise jo hai families hoti hain ya patients concern hote hain ki we have egg allergies so we can either we can go for vaccination or not yes they can go for vaccination there is no contraindication of vaccines with the egg allergic patients okay let's discuss this patient case A six-month-old infant who was born 24 weeks gestation is brought to the clinic in October for routine checkup and immunization, which is the best recommendation to make for this patient's immunization schedule. इसका कोई आंसर बताएँ. Only two of the five immunization due should be given at the same time. oral polio vaccine should be used to reduce the number of injection needed to complete the scheduled vaccine should be based on the corrected gestational age rather than on chronic chronic means uh, actual age because he was born prematurely influenza vaccine should be administered with all other scheduled vaccination Okay, most of you are saying C. So the answer is D. It's not C. It's D. It's because. Uh, जैसे कि मैंने आपको पहले ही बताया था कि अगर कि सिक्स मंथ ओल्ड इन्फेंट है. और उसकी सिक्स मंथ की वैक्सीनेशन ड्यू है तो हम उसके एक्चुअल एज को कंसीडर करते हुए वैक्सीनेशन देंगे राइडर देन इट्स करेक्टेड गैसटेशनल एज करेक्टेड गैसटेशनल एज की उस बेसिस पे हम वैक्सीनेशन को स्केड्यूल नहीं करते हम जो एक्चुअल एज होती है पेशेंट की उसकी बेसिस पर हम वैक्सीनेशन स्केड्यूल करते हैं तो अगर आप देखें वैक्सीनेशन स्केड्यूल इन सिक्स मंथ इन्फ्लुंजा इज एडिड Uh, along with other vaccine so answer d is correct okay now let's discuss quickly pediatric seizures disorder it's basically the seizures that occur in pediatric population is due to high fever so febrile seizure is the most common type of seizure in pediatric patient and it is divided into simple and complex febrile seizures Sim in simple uh, febrile seizures brief generalized seizures that occur once during 24 hour period of life less than 15 minutes no evidence of damage no metabolic disturbance or no history of febrile seizures it it is purely due to high fever and second uh, complex one of the following febrile child prolong more than 15 years of seizure focal seizure occur more than once in 24 hours focal means partial seizures har thodi der baad ho rahe hain ya jo hai 24 hours mein uski frequency ek seizure se zyada hai ek episode se zyada hai so it will be counted in a complex seizure 
now there are uh, different treatment options based on the seizure types it's going to allow to describe nikke because seizure is uh, itself a vast topic uh, and whenever you are uh, you know learning and uh, going through the pediatric side of seizure topic uh, go through more detail of types of seizures drug of choice and what are the alternative suggest for the treatment and which drugs which anti seizures drugs uh, levels are being recommended uh, we do um, a phenytoin phenobarb valproic acid levels in arkhan and check the levels and then uh, maintain the uh, dose and recommend the dose according to the levels so um, these uh, are these are the uh, based on the these are the uh, brief treatment option based on the seizure types um, uh, one thing to remember which is very important and commonly also asked in exams that the the drug of choice for absence seizure is at uh, etosuzumide and for infantile spasm we have vibrabactrin in aku that we use for, with all the patient with infantile spasm and along with these uh, anti seizures uh, we also use diazepam for uh, the <clears throat> for reducing the active seizures activity especially in the patient with uh, with severe uh, uh, severe you know uh, status epilepticus uh, we use uh, diazepam as a first drug of choice and also iv lorazepam is also recommended so these are the references thank you i hope ki aap logo ko kuch thoda thoda samajh aa gaya ho uh thank you so much dr mehreen for this elaborate presentation participants you may ask your questions in the chat box or may open your mic there is one question uh, by um, ahmed raza that uh, i have seen mmr given to pregnant patients as prophylaxis by gynecologists it would be given it might be given the late uh, you know pregnancy gestational week in the last weeks of the gestation for the high risk patients and uh, for, like tetanus tetanus is also given to the uh, pregnant woman in 7 to 8 week of pregnancy so if the patient is at high risk or uh, then it might be recommended but not in the first trimester or second trimester mm, can we use oseltamivir for rsv and peds ahmed raza is asking yes yes we are using oseltamivir for prophylaxis and also for the treatment purpose uh, for viral infection in akuh as well and the, usually the recommended doses for prophylaxis is qd uh, 3 mg per kg for dose qd and for uh, uh, treatment purpose it's bid Three mg per kg per dose BID in pediatric patients. Okay, so Iman, you can share your uh, contact number um, here with uh, me uh, privately, or so you can be added in the WhatsApp group, and uh, all the lectures will be available on GBPT uh, YouTube channel in after a few days. Um. Ahmed is again asking that, ma'am, is there any standard available to categorize baby weight or low birth weight? Yes, there are standard uh, guidelines available that categorizes the uh, preterm baby into low body weight, extreme, very low body weight, extremely low body weight according to their weight of the patients. Like if the patient is weight is um, less than two point five kg. then it is categorized as low body weight then if it is less than 
टू के जी और वन पॉइंट फाइव के जी इट इज कैटेगराइज एज लो वेरी लो बॉडी वेट एंड देन इफ इट इज लेस देन वन के जी इट इज कैटेगराइज एज एक्सट्रीमली लो बॉडी वेट एंड इट इज दिस इज ऑल्सो अवेलेबल ऑनलाइन एंड रिकमेंडेड यू कैन सी दैट those who need to be added in the group you may share your contacts here and i have also um, given uh, the references in the last and you can check it out on there as well for the classification okay so anam malik is asking that why am i that injection given to pregnant women it is because uh, if a patient is at high risk for developing a regular uh, regular infection like uh, uh, measles mumps or rubella this is a, ve a vaccine which prevents the uh, uh, these causative agents this or uh, infection so agar ek patient uh, high risk par hai to before pregnancy usko ye uh, uh, vaccine di ja sakti hai taki baby ko bhi prevent kar sake और उसकी इम्यूनाइजेशन से जो है वो बेबी को भी हो सके फायदा हो सके जिसकी वजह से हम देते हैं वरना अगर आप फर्स्ट या सेकंड ट्राइमिस्टर की बात करें तो इट्स कॉन्ट्रो इंडिकेटेड बट जस्ट बिफोर डिलीवरी या नाइन्थ मंथ में आप रिकमेंड कर सकते हैं या डॉक्टर दे सकते हैं बट इट इज अकॉर्डिंग टू द कंडीशन और ये बहुत रेयर दिया जाता है ओके सो मोहदत Mother is asking that my mother is taking anti TB for TB meningitis since last ten mm -hmm. months. Her hearing is now too much compromised. How long uh, anti TB should be given? Look, anti TB का तो आपका पूरा course होता है ना. अब ये जो है उसके ऊपर भी डिफेंड करता है कि आपके लैब रिजल्ट्स कैसे हैं अगर कि वैसे तो नाइन मंथ्स की भी रिकमेंडेशन है टेन मंथ्स की भी है इसकी जो है ट्वेल्व मंथ्स की रिकमेंडेशन भी है डिफरेंट रिकमेंडेशन है अकॉर्डिंग टू द पेशेंट कंडीशन ये तो आपको डॉक्टर ही बेहतर बता सकता है लेकिन अकॉर्डिंग टू द पेशेंट कंडीशन और को मॉबिट्स इसकी डोजिंग गाइडलाइन है अगर बेबी एक बेबी बॉर्न हुआ है थर्टी टू वीक पे तो दिस थर्टी टू वीक इज गेस्टेशनल एज प्लस it's actual age if patient is one week old so 32 week plus one week 33 week is corrected gestational age of the patient okay so uh, is there any question left by the participants because we have uh, not much time left so amara fine is asking that peds usually have compromised renal functions mm -hmm. does vanco or the antibiotic affecting renal function should be given with renal adjusted doses exactly we give uh, renal adjusted doses of vancomycin and to the patients whose uh, creatinine is low high or who's getting clearance is high but uh, we adjust the vancomycin doses in uh, akuh according to their level we send the levels and then uh, adjust the dose accordingly if the patient do not have meningitis then the most, then the uh, levels of recommendation is around 10 to 15 and if the patient has meningitis then the blood level should be greater than 15 and of uh, the levels are usually done before the fourth dose uh, like hum uh, teen doses di and then fourth dose se pehle humne ek top level karwa diya vancomycin ka and then according to that we adjust the dose and we also keep monitoring creatinine